Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Brahim bin Jilloun Twimi. I'm director on the board of Bank of Africa and uh, Dele Delegate General Manager. The uh, theme we'll be discussing this afternoon is how can the private sector scale up access to sustainable and inclusive funds in Africa? And for that, we have a very interesting panel, short time, but very interesting panel. We'll be hearing uh, the, uh, the answers to some of the questions I'll be asking from a perspective of a European multilateral financial institution, EBRD, which is the host of this conference, Monsieur Francis Malige, managing director in charge of financial institutions. And uh, we'll have also from a perspective of an African regional and multilateral financial institution, the Bank West African for the Development, uh, Mrs. Valérie Noel Kodjo Diop is in charge of innovation and sustainable development. She should be with us uh, uh, in remote. I don't know if we have Mrs. Uh, Valérie Diop Kodjo Diop. Uh, we'll have also from a perspective of a Pan-African private bank, Bank of Africa UK PLC, and we have with us Mr. Bunmi Otoki, Head of Loans and Solutions and Syndication. And we have also with us from a perspective, we'll be discussing also from this perspective of a European a civil society organization called Education for Employment. So, a CSO dedicated to education. We have with us its CEO for Europe, Mrs. Anna Martinengi. And last, uh, she should be uh, on a remote, Mrs. Uh, Omo, Omutayo Adeola, that will be the perspective and investment and project development firm based in Ireland. Uh, the questions that uh, will be that we'll be discussing, even if, if we have short time for each panelist, but they will choose to answer to um, any or to overweigh any part of, of the answers. Um, firstly, what are the key financing challenges to financing or and barriers to financing sustainable and inclusive projects? The second questions are, what are the key opportunities of emerging impact lens for financing SDGs? And last, are there any extra financial 
factors that could help this uh, uh, SDG financing. Uh, I would like uh, to start with Monsieur Francis Malige and probably ask him, well, we would expect that the existence of EDRD, World Bank, African Development Bank, Asian Bank, would be sufficient to allow, to allow for an enlar enlar enlarged access to sustainable and inclusive funds. Why do you think the role of the private sector is so is of importance? Well, I, I think it's, uh, first of all, it's a matter of size. Mm -hmm. Meaning, the, the investments of the IFIs, be it the BRD, the World Bank, uh, the African Bank, the regional development banks, it's a huge amount when you look at it. It's billions and billions. But as compared to the investment of the private sector, it's tiny. Mm -hmm. And when you look at, uh, for example, the amount that is needed globally to uh, actually green the economies globally, you're talking about trillions of dollars every year that are needed to be invested in the next uh, decade. And if you don't mobilize the private sector, then you cannot achieve the result, even with all of the energies and the, and the focus yes, of the indeed. IFIs to do this. And so, and from that standpoint, actually, the role of banks is mm -hmm. absolutely crucial because banks, the image I often use is uh, in an economy, the banks play the same role as the blood circulation system in the human body. They take mm -hmm. the blood to the muscle, that is the companies that need to grow the economy. And if you manage to green the blood, then the entire body becomes green. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's what the banks achieve. Yeah. So what would, what would, would be then the role of EBRD vis-a-vis -vis banks in order to help green them, to green the economy? Yes. So actually, it's twofold. The first thing that EBRD does is actually lend money to banks through specific projects like we have done with BMC, like the Morsef in Morocco. Uh, can you hear me better now? Okay. So specific projects where we lend amounts of money to banks so that they can then on lend them to green projects for their clients. And these projects have a demonstration effect. They become an example of how to green your operations as a client. But the second stage, which we are actually launching now, is to cooperate with our banks so that everything that they do corresponds to good green risk management, yeah. green governance, mm -hmm. and that ultimately is not just the funding from the BRD that is deployed in a green manner, it's the entire DNA of the bank that okay. becomes green. And that is a, a, a process through which we are, uh, that we are starting to implement with our 300 or so partner financial institutions in our 36 countries of operations, and we are very happy that BMCO is at the forefront of it. Thank you very much. Maybe just to go a little bit ahead of time, Mrs. Valérie uh, Kodjo Diop, uh, what, I mean, among the three questions I asked, financing the, the financing challenges and barriers, um, the, the, the key opportunities of emerging impact lens, and last, the extra financial factors, what would you like to insist on and uh, in, among these three uh, questions. And, and I'd like to focus on the impact side, but, uh, but every, uh, good, good day, everybody. Um, uh, the subject is indeed you know, paramount, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to share some thoughts uh, on this important topic of the uh, affordability of loans to the private sector. The affordability is somehow the, the reflection of the cost of risk. Affordability is indeed another way to express cost of risk that banks are facing. It's a matter of on which side we position yourself, from the borrower side or the lender side. So anything that can help to reduce the cost of risk will have a direct impact on affordability. Any pocket of additional cash could help to solve the equation. So, so basically, um, we, we know that normally, you know, I mean, the, the, the traditional way of lending you know, money to the, to, the, to the private sector is based on payment risk, where we hold risk on, um, the, you know, I mean, the, the people, you know, which have a, a little bit of, you know, weakness in terms of, of, of solvency or, you know, you have to take, you know, on, on conference, you know, that bear risk and all that. So what we decided you know, to do is just to consider, you know, a new way of addressing and uh, monetizing, you know, impact could be, uh, uh, I would say, an answer uh, to, you know, these gaps 
on uh, on SDG and may you know give you know some some road you know in order you know to put together uh, you know funding you know to the private sector. So any additional cash you know could help. So in this sense, monetizing you know impact is something you know which is key. Another way to do it you know will be also monetizing you know carbon. Uh, especially, you know, on the low carbon, low carbon, you know, industry that we want to support, you know, also, you know, valuing, you know, the carbon, you know, will have some additionality, you know, as well. But, you know, as far as, uh, you know, I mean, uh, the BOAD, you know, is concerned, I'm sure that you know that we are accredited, you know, in some sort of uh, green funds and all that. And we are co-financing deals where we can extend, you know, maturity that goes up to 18 years with interest rates, you know, that are between, you know, 4.5, and 5.12, you know, I mean, all in. So those are, you know, so I think that if you can bring additionality and just have some way, new way, innovative way, you know, uh, to value, you know, impact, uh, maybe, you know, that's the way, you know, we can handle it. Yeah. Um, you are a banker on the ground, and I think that you already thought of all the challenges that uh, uh, this, uh, that we are facing in order to uh, enlarge indeed the access to affordable, uh, inclusive finance. So what, what is your experience? If you had to list a certain number of challenges, what would it they be? What? Thank you very much. Uh, thanks for inviting me. Actually, the, for us, the key issue is mainly the... Oh, to talk. Hello? Yeah. Oh, so apologies, <laughs> Anna. <laughs> now you can hear me. The, the, actually, I was very keen to hear what uh, uh, my co-panelist here said, uh, Mr. Francis, on, with respect to uh, working with the banks uh, to improve the commerce, to help the banks on this transaction. But the key, the key problems that we face, the key challenges, I won't call them problems because they're always solutions for problems, is one, is the most of the projects that we see in Africa, we need to have them in a bankable situation where most of these projects are, they might be great for venture capitals, but for banks, we do projects, not, we don't finance ideas. That's one of the key problems we see. The way we try to <coughs> mitigate that it's by helping the, uh, the borrowers, uh, this project developers, to actually uh, draft, the the, draft the agreement, the PPAs in, in the cases of solar or wind. That's what we try to do for them and do the modeling. Another key aspect of it is finding insurance. Insurance is very difficult for us when we try to uh, mitigate the risk in Africa because most of the developers in Africa are actually the small entities and they are the ones that actually matter the most because what we try to finance are entities that can actually go into the different communities. For instance, I would rather finance a guy in Cameroon that is actually looking at f uh, rural electrification in Cameroon because I know the guy is going to be, he's going to have the chief the community chief with him and have all these people with them and I know that the risk there will be minimal because the community believes you're there to help them. Therefore, they're going to pr protect that mini plant. That's what we like to see. The third issue that we find, which was just alluded to by uh, my co-panelist Valerie, is where the bank is the tenor of the facilities. Most commercial banks, unlike my colleagues from EBRD, can do 20 years, 30 years, but commercial banks, we are limited to seven years. Absolutely. That makes it very difficult for us to participate, although I do also know that EBRD as well as IFC and AfriExim have something out there where they can exit, uh, where there's an exit for uh, or provide insurance or exit uh, the commercial banks after seven years. How could we circumvent this problem of tenor? The, the, the way to circumvent this, the way I see we can do this is easily by taking, the, if when we have the EBRDs or the IFCs as part of the transaction for, in, as part of the lenders in the transaction, my credit committee would be a, a bit more comfortable they to go the, the distance. Exactly, it, enza it enhances it. But when they're not part of it, it's very difficult. The fourth and probably the most difficult challenge that we have, which is very difficult for us to do, the commercial banks, is in the sense where the, the developers are lacking the development funds. They have a great idea, but we, I cannot finance a, a developer 100% of the project fund. They have to inject some equity, and this is where we need the EBRDs. I know EBRD is working with, it has a, a few of this kind of funds, as well as AfriExim. That needs to be spread out, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa, 
this is these are the greatest challenges that we have. Thank that you. one, there isn't a lot of mitigant that the commercial banks can do there. Thank you very much. I would like to now turn to Mrs. Omatoyo Adeola of Restorium Capital. Uh, it's an investment project development firm. Um, what I mean, what would you consider, Madam, as uh, the key opportunities this time, because we've talked about the challenges, and, and of course you may answer also to challenges, but what do you, how do you see the key opportunities uh, in terms of impact? Uh, in, in, I mean, considering your experience as a, a development firm and, uh, and raising funds for projects and an on-ground too experience. Thank you so much for inviting me. Um, uh, I'm really glad to be here. In terms of opportunities, this is the best time for impact investors um, to take advantage of opportunities that we have in Sub-Saharan Africa. Because if you really want to make an impact, Africa is the best place for you. When we look at the gaps, in infrastructure, in the gaps in SDG development and all that, Africa is the place for you to be where you can generate good returns and you can still do something for the society and do something for the environment. So the, 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 the opportunities are enormous. You could earn the market-related risk-adjusted returns and still be able to have impact on, on key um, SDG goals. Then the good thing is that there's a growing interest and acceptance when we come to impact investing right now because even uh, by virtue of the investors, I'm requesting that the asset managers should not just invest for returns, they should equally invest for impact. So impact investing is growing, is getting great acceptance, acceptability in the market. And, and so many uh, investors are looking to achieve the two bottom um, uh, goals of um, earnings and impact, but the so but what we now have is that we need to the regulatory environment need to support the initiatives. In as much as the market is forcing the asset managers to invest, then they need to look at areas where we really need the most in, uh, 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 that will achieve the most impact. When we look at um, a Greek business. Agric is the largest employer of labor in Sub-Saharan Africa, and that should be looking to. Then we look at when we should be looking at uh, provision of water and uh, uh, sanitation. That should be looked into. Right now, most of the impact funds are focusing on renewable energies. Yes, it's good because they can get um, their returns quickly, but there are other um, impact areas that we so much need attention to be given into, like I've mentioned, the agri business, the water and sanitation. It might not bring as much return as renewable energies and uh, green, but it will have the most impact on the population. Thank you. So the opportunity is enormous. Thank you very much, Madam. Anna, uh, we talked about barriers and probably the lack of skills in the, in the different countries. How, how could uh, your uh, foundation, Education for Employment, your, how could you help first? And how do you see this problem there? How, how do you see, I mean, assess the, the lack of skillful uh, people? Yes, um, I think, you know, skilling, um, you, you, uh, you nailed it. It's, um, it's human capital. Human capital is both a challenge due to the lack of skills, uh, but an opportunity. You look at Africa, um, there's so much potential. You've got, um, Africa has the territory. Africa has the natural resources. Africa has the human capital. It has the human resources that many other countries um, don't have. The population is young, the population is vibrant, the population wants to do things. But without the skills, no investment will be able to bear fruit. Sometimes we talk about trillions and trillions of dollars, but if you don't have a population, a workforce, that's able to harness these new opportunities to do the jobs that are being created, to harness the green agenda, the, any investments will have no return, no return yeah. on investment, and no, no return and on impact. And what would be the role of women in this context? 
well, women um, make up 50%, over 50% of the, of the population, mm -hmm. but yet they're largely excluded um, from the labor market. Sometimes they have uh, more education than men, they just don't have the opportunity. Um, women, for example, uh, it is said there's so many studies that say that uh, households, they're led by women, um, they save more, uh, they create more output, they spend sensibly, um, entrepreneurship. Women are very eager to become entrepreneurs and create their enterprises, but they have no access to finance. They have uh, no collateral sometimes to get loans, no credit history, no digital inclusion, no skills to be able to create those businesses and then grow those businesses. It has a multiplier effect. Women tend to hire more women. It's a multiplier effect, I guess. Would you like Francis Goussevalich yeah, Absolutely. I, I can only agree, um, especially on the notion that, uh, first of all, uh, um, you know, women are indeed 50% of, uh, <laughs> of our population, uh, but uh, also that uh, in, in many societies, women do not have access to collateral the way men do, because when the time comes, I'm mean, not even talking about religious decisions of you give more to the guys than to the girls, but uh, um, when often in many societies, when uh, inheritance is, is shared, the real estate goes to the guys, and the, and the cash or the jewelry goes to the goes to the girls. And then, of course, it's much easier to give a land as collateral than to give an earring as collateral, <laughs> right? So that's why we actually have developed products, which we've given to some of our partner banks, where there is a first loss coverage. We tell them, yes, the female entrepreneurs are not going to bring collateral. Therefore, we're going to replace that collateral with a first loss guarantee provided by donors, which we then uh, pass on to the, the banks. And what happens more often than not is that a few years down the line, the banks realize that the female entrepreneurs have not gone bust. They actually have a better score in terms of uh, difficulty, uh, credit difficulties than the men with their, all their collateral and their mature attitude to entrepreneurship. And, and so what happens then is the banks go, oh, right. So maybe we should actually launch a, a product for female entrepreneurs without the collateral requirements that Absolutely. we normally would ask. We are touching upon the extra financial, uh, I think, factors, right? Uh, but beforehand, I would like just to say that our discussion is illustrated by an illustrator uh, called Josh, a British citizen, so we will see this. And I wanted also to say that uh, our, though our followers, please get ready, uh, also to, if you're online or here, uh, and then you will get your mobile phone in order to, uh, uh, you will be asked to cast your vote and your questions if you go to the uh, site, website slido.com and put the code 9-91700. Thank you. So extra financial, extra financial factors. Maybe um, who would like to, uh, to take the floor? Uh, for the extra financial factors. We, I think we talk about blended finance. Is it a new type of coffee for financiers? <laughs> uh, like? I would, actually, I'd like to start out with the comment that my uh, co-panelists made here because it's something that I'm very passionate about, which is in Africa, is the youths. Uh, we talk about women, I'm very concerned about women, of course, I have a mom, I have a wife too, but, uh, and I have a daughter, but the, the youth in Africa, we seem to be straying away from them because there's so many youths out there without a job, and I think some of these uh, impact products that uh, my colleague Omotayo mentioned earlier would be, the, would be the case that actually can improve uh, the economy in Africa, improve the security. For instance, I'm originally from Nigeria myself, a lot of the people, a lot of this uh, unrest you hear about in Nigeria is basically because of lack of inclusion. So you want something that includes the community, where the community can actually be part of it. If, you, if I build a, a, I don't know, a plant in a, in a rural area, a mini grid or wind farm or agribusiness, I want the, the locals to be part of it, to, to be owners. That's what's going to work. Uh, that's what's going to make the, uh, the situation better without having the, uh, any of these uh, security issues. Now, coming back to your, to your question on the blended finance, I would, I would state simply, it is uh, for, for, bank, for commercial banks, 
we are trying to, uh, to do to, to emulate what the EBRDs of this world or IFC do, where they actually also provide technical, ad technical uh, advisory services to projects. But as I said, in Africa, it's very difficult to, for commercial banks to do this. Because one, for commercial banks, we have a problem where if I provide advisory services without a fee, it's very difficult for me to justify that in-house at the bank, particularly when the project doesn't succeed, doesn't go through. And you and I both know, probably you know better than I do, that uh, we see a thousand projects, but maybe 10 of them are actually viable. But if you spend a lot of time on this, we need, uh, you will lose a lot of, uh, you wouldn't be able to accomplish anything. So what we need is we need to find a way to have advisory services that will be combined with the financing. I think IFC and e EBRD, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, I think yes. there's a department that does that We've at the, at these banks. And we also, commercial banks, need to do this because we are actually on the ground. We know the people. I go to the villages when I do my due diligence report. I go to the bush and I meet the chiefs and people coming around, singing, dancing, going, oh, you're going to bring electricity to our neighborhood. I can, those are the people that I want to talk to. We would like to, to listen to also to Valérie Noël and to Omar Toyo at Deola among these extra financial factors. Um, how do you address these issues in your institution, in your firm? Valérie you Noël? Yes, hello. Hello. Like um, Bully had said, we face that we see that challenge every day when it comes to development fund. We, for example, we have um, a top road, a good project that we are raising funding for in the southern African country. In fact, the project we have um, investors that signify that yes, they would invest this, but we need development fund. And we are, we are stuck on that right now. So we need, we need the, um, the DFIs to do more in that area. And we need them to work with us on the ground to, for us so that when we have those projects that are bankable, but need development from which the commercial banks could not. In actual fact, in the, as a, an example, that particular project, we got a bank that said, oh, they might be interested. But when the discussion continues, I know they would not be able to do that. So we need access to those development funds to be able to make sure those projects get off the ground. We have a number of that. So after this meeting, I would like to, if there's any opportunity to connect with such opportunities, I wouldn't mind. Then another problem is capacity building. We need, um, for example, for venture capitalists, um, they, we have accelerator programs whereby um, entrepreneurs can come in and they can be uh, trained on what to do, how to um, sell their form, how to model, do their ideas, how to get funding, how to raise this, how to write. We don't have that for um, entrepreneurs, project promoters, project sponsors in Africa. We don't have that. So it would be good if, we could have, in conjunction with um, the uh, development financial institutions, if we can set up as a little program for project sponsors, so that as they are coming up with these projects, they will know what to do, and they will know the checklist that make those projects bankable, because that's the major reason we have. People have ideas, they have projects, but those projects are not bankable, and so we we need ID, we need assistance in terms of capacity building. And as Bumi had said earlier on, yes, commercial banks cannot be doing advice pay services. So how do we plug the gap? So we need private sector uh, driven in conjunction with the DFIs to run this. So those would help in surmounting the challenges. Another challenge that we've come across again is the currency risk. We know that countries in the sub-Saharan Africa, we, we have been having issues with volatility in our currencies. So there need to be edging instruments that would help, that would make the investors to be, uh, to, 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 to have a bit of confidence that when they need to exit, they will not uh, have lost all the value in their capital. So that is another issue uh, that we you. need assistance. 
Thank you. Valérie, Valérie Noël, is um, extra financial factors and, and blended finance one of the strategies axes of uh, the Western African Development Bank, BOAD? This is certainly something that we're going to be considering. But I just want to add, you know, something, you know, I mean, uh, on the, the different subjects, you know, that you've just covered, you know, I mean, uh, uh, you know, before. Um, I want to say as well that data will be also something, a tool that we're going to be using. And I think that, you know, the way now that we're going to be assessing, uh, you know, the risk, you know, of the small and medium-sized, you know, enterprises will not be any more uh, financial, you know, I mean, uh, scoring, but it will be also behavior, you know, scoring. And you can build, you know, on data scoring model, uh, and you will have a new risk approach towards, you know, I mean, uh, all these people. I think it's something, you know, which is important that I want, you know, to have. Uh, and you know that as well that women at, at the epicenter of, you know, the, you know, the, the, the small and medium, you know, size, you know, enterprises. And I think that, you know, financial literacy will be something certainly that would help. Uh, and you know what, you know, I, sometimes, you know, when you look at, when, when you're asking, you know, for, you know, the way, you know, I mean, the body will support, as you, as you know, we don't have access directly, you know, I mean, through, you know, I mean, small, medium enterprises, you know, or private sector. We do it, you know, through support that we're providing, you know, to commercial banks, uh, where we earn lend, you know, money, you know, that will flow directly, you know, to the private sector. So we want, you know, to push, uh, you know, some sort of uh, initiative uh, in order, you know, to boost, uh, you know, the, 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 the amount, you know, that can be given, you know, to the private sector. There's another way, you know, to do it, you know, we can, do some sort of, you know, originate to distribute model where, you know, we help, you know, I mean, to increase the volume that, you know, micro uh, uh, finance uh, uh, institution that we're supporting, you know, will and lend, you know, I mean, uh, to, to people. So when you're talking about extra, uh, you know, I mean, uh, support that we can provide, you know, to the sector, I think that, of course, you know, the build capacity is important, but I want, you know, to give focus on the financial literacy that we can provide you know, to women. We can even sometimes rely on mobile money where you can't, you know, I mean, have some sort of true gamification, you know, I mean, for women, especially, you know, on the agro business, you know, that can't, you know, I mean, get themselves familiar with, you know, managing a little business model. And on the top of that, as I was explaining, when we use our wallet, you know, you have a lot of data where, you know, you have payments, you know, for, I don't know, you know, insurance policy, health and all that. And all those data, you know, will give you some light on behavior you know, of a, a certain population, and then you can extend funding, you know, based on behavior of people. When you say that people are taking insurance policy, if people are looking at the health, so it means that, you know, they have great intention, you know, to perform, you know, you know I mean, uh, the service of the debt. So those are things, you know, which are important. We will focus on women because we think that women are really at the epicenter of, you know, small, medium-sized medium enterprises. We want to support them, you know, to help to empower them, uh, provide them financial literacy and support them. So that will be my answer. Th thank you, Valérie Noël. Francis, what, what EBRD is very concretely doing to help this uh, greening of banks and greening of the economy? What kind of toolkit does it offer to, uh, to ultimately customers of, of the banks? I think it's, it's really important to, uh, to build, uh, to build uh, the context. We can certainly do all of these good things of uh, lending money to banks and then to individuals and have technical assistance, which we do concretely. Uh, but uh, uh, we cannot, I think one of the key lessons I take, and we do not work in Sub-Saharan Africa mm. yet, but uh, one of the key lessons I'd like to bring from the 30 odd countries in Central and Eastern Europe and, and, and North Africa where we work is that ultimately, if you want to achieve scale, you cannot go past the building of a good business environment. You are talking about uh, uh, hedging. There's no hedging without proper capital markets. Yeah, yeah. If you want good capital markets, you need a certain type of business environment. You need to build a sort of the expectation among the economic actors that property rights will be okay, that your PPA will actually be implemented yeah. The government will not launch uh, Good you know, silly projects like yeah. sometimes the public yeah. sector does. You know, I, I wear a tie with white elephants because <laughs> I prefer the white elephants to stay on the tie right. than to go into the projects we are asked to finance. But yeah. I see so from time to time. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and then, of course, uh, that, that's an area where, where we invest a lot of time. 
On Monday, we were in Rabat signing, for example, an agreement, an MOU with the Central, Central Bank, Bank of Morocco on uh, climate risk for banks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's the kind of things we do. We combine the policy with the investment, and that enables us to me to, to to have more impact than just through the size of our balance sheet, which is limited. Mm -hmm. And so by by having this uh, this impact on the way countries are run, and uh, then working with the banks themselves, and then working with the clients, yeah, yeah. You, you can bring it all together into a coherent uh, strategy for transforming the country. Absolutely. Anna, you are advocating, I think, that uh, the private sector should adopt an ACG, SEG approach within a holistic uh, approach. What does it mean concretely? I mean, holistic approach, and how do you see that? And to what extent your e e e EFE contribute to that? Yes, um, as, as you said, I mean, I think there's a greater realization and, and a move towards uh, corporate social responsibility, towards uh, um, an ESG approach, because it's, it's not just the, it's the job, it's the environment, it's the people. Um, we, need, we need, as you said, a holistic approach, and it's not only the private sector. Uh, it has to be a concerted effort, and this is what uh, education for employment what we do, the private sector is key. It's one of the main actors, but it's not the only actor. Okay. Governments have to do their part. There are reforms that need to be made to enable the private sector to grow and offer opportunities for the population. Educational institutions, we work with educational institutions, with universities. They need to teach the skills that young people need to have to access the opportunities now, but also in the future. They need to prepare the workforce to adapt and evolve as the market evolves. Yeah. Um, families. Families need to be on board. We talked about youth. We talked about women. Um, in many cultures, there are many social norms that place the burden, we all know, I mean, of childcare, of housework, mm -hmm. on women. Sometimes, you know, women are not allowed to do certain jobs because it's not socially acceptable. It's not safe. We need families on board. Education, they always say education starts at home. Yes, it starts at home and then it continues in school. Children need to be taught from a very early age, social and emotional skills. They mm -hmm. need to be able to communicate. They need to be able to have self-confidence and then they can learn at university technical skills. Then they can go to the you know, jobs at the private sector and learn on the job. The private sector needs to provide opportunities, needs to provide finance. Um, we have NGOs. Uh, we do our part as well. Community-based organizations. Sometimes it's difficult to get to, to rural areas. Sometimes people, you know, you talk about chiefs. They don't want to talk to a foreigner. They don't want to talk to somebody else. So you need community-based organizations to work and reach out to these people and youth themselves. Yeah. It has to be a youth-centered approach. They need to be on board. And they need to want to learn and to grow. And it's our yeah. job, I think, everybody's job, to provide them with these opportunities and show them that yeah. if they want, they can do yeah. it. But me, you are based in London mm -hmm. and you see your other commercial bankers. Are you optimistic uh, about uh, a future where, uh, whereby you will find commercial banks being a kind of one-stop shop uh, of a blended finance products? and having uh, in these products assistance, uh, having training, having uh, subsidies. Do, do you feel that we, we are getting to this stage when I, you talk to your colleagues yeah, in London? Well, well, we've actually discussed this a few times with some of my other colleagues who do the same thing I do. And to be honest with you, it's not whether we feel optimistic or not. It's just that's where it's going to go. That's where the market is going to go. So we don't have a choice but, to, but be that. So that's what we have to do at the end of the day. The question is, how long is it going to take to get to that, to that stage? That I can't answer. To be, I don't know the answer to it. I hope it's sooner than later. But yes. And Francis, from your side as a multilateral institution and according to the discussions you have with the commercial bankers, you feel that we are going to this, uh, yes. they would, we may get to this stage? So first of all, when, when I listen to you, I think, <coughs> in fact, you've already moved from blended finance into value-added finance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's because, right. you know, blended, is, blended carries this notion of, okay, there's a government subsidy mm -hmm. somewhere that is blended, cheaper finance, blended with commercial finance and so on. And it is a good start, it is the seed, uh, but, you know, it needs to move into 
self-sustainable uh, mode. Uh, and, and what you describe is actually the way commercial banks make themselves more relevant <laughs> with their clients. And that's what we, we're trying to do with our clients. But, you know, our best hope is to not be needed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. our, our goal ultimately is to make ourselves irrelevant. Commerci uh, I'm sorry, commercial banks appropriate because all exactly. this approach. And, and uh, recently I was in one of our most advanced countries of operations in the mm. Czech Republic. Yeah. And all of the banks I met there have a dedicated unit to create blended finance products. And they go and negotiate themselves with their local government or with the EU, access to guarantees, mm -hmm. technical assistance, mm -hmm. and so on. And I'm like, fantastic, you don't need me anymore. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. In Bank of Africa, Morocco, I have to say this, we're trying to do that. <laughs> yes, indeed. <laughs> La séquence commerciale. <laughs> um, I think that we have 20 more minutes to go, and uh, probably we have to go back to the audience in some minutes, but has, has anyone would like to um, add something before we give the floor to the audience for its questions? We have received, uh, 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 I'm sorry, we have received, let me see, I'll try to, uh, to see the iPad, but we have received a, a, a question, but uh, I missed the page. Bon, anyway, maybe the audience, we, we would like to see if anyone is interested in asking a question to our panelists. The, the I think they still yeah. have to go through the uh, the app if they want to ask a question. Yeah. yeah. The, there's no roaming My microphone. My problem is <laughs> les écouteurs qui tombent. Je suis désolé. That there are two mics here, so if anyone would like to, uh, oh, yeah, to, okay. to and um, I have, if someone could fix the iPad, please, because I I have no more the page. Mm -hmm. Yes, please. We have a, a question here in the second <laughs> row. D'accord. Uh, please introduce yourself. Thank you. And ask your question. And to whom you would like more specifically. Good afternoon, so, everyone. Uh, plus fort, plus fort. Hello. Yes, please. Okay now? Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Gabi from Bank of Africa. Mm -hmm. um, I have a, my question goes like this. Um, from what we heard from our panelists' insightful interventions, is that there is a lot of challenges when it comes to um, sustainability and inclusion in Africa. And my question is, uh, according to what we've been witnessing uh, from these two to three past years, that is COVID-19 and the ongoing Ukraine crisis, how do you think this two, the outcome of these two events can impact Africa's sustainability journey. I mean, by that, do you think it is an asset that Africa can use to foster its, its, its sustainability journey? Or do you think it will be um, a kind of hurdle that will come to make the challenges get um, worse? Or I don't know, that will come to, uh, it's another challenge that Africa will have to deal with. Thank you. Who would like to answer this question? Uh, maybe I, c I can take a grab because uh, for, for because uh, for me I think with COVID the issues the issues we have over the past couple of years COVID and the unfortunate incident with Russia and uh, Ukraine it could actually be looked at in two ways. You could say it's a um, it's a negative for Africa. Yes, it is a negative because prices have gone up. But it could also be a positive for Africa in the sense that I see now Europe is trying to substitute gas from Africa for gas from, uh, from, from Russia. Uh, products from Africa from, as opposed to products, agricultural products from uh, B Belarus and uh, even Ukraine. I think that's something that we need to look at. It could be an advantage, meaning particularly on the agri agricultural the ag agribusiness and as well as gas. So I think it could be something that could be advantageous for Africa. But of course, we are in the in, in the short term basis. It's it's painful for everyone, not just Africa, but for the whole world. It is painful everywhere. Before taking a question, we have we may have projected the illustration, so maybe it will inspire more questions. Josh, if we can project your illustration. Can I maybe add a word yes, please, on this please, on this no, question please. because I do agree with what you said and. Uh, but I think we also need to put things in a, in a longer term perspective. Yes, we've had the COVID crisis. Yes, there is war in Ukraine. 
But let's not forget that there's climate change coming. And that climate change is actually going to hit African countries due to their social economic development characteristics and due to their location, harder than uh, European countries, harder than North America and so on. And if you combine this with the, uh, the economic and the, uh, the population growth of, uh, of Africa, and if you want to avoid dramatic uh, uh, migrations and if you want to uh, avoid the dislocation of societies, mm -hmm. we have to build prosperity in the private sector as a number one long-term imperative across the continent, mm -hmm. from Morocco all the way down. Uh, and from that standpoint, the way the Moroccan banks are developing is actually exemplary because you're creating linkages between mm -hmm. these countries. You're playing a big role in integrating the continent, perhaps, yeah. you know, even more than the politicians, maybe, yes. you know, you're far ahead of them. <laughs> uh, and uh, so let's not forget this long-term long thing, uh, uh, these long-term challenges, because we always have, there will always be a daily crisis to deal yeah. with. Uh, and I, I don't want to obviously uh, you know, deny the importance and the gravity of the war in Ukraine, um, but let's not forget the long-term challenges that this continent faces. The, please, any, uh, yes. Oui, Mr. Moulin, please. Uh, uh, le premier rang, first row, Mr. Moulin. We have more, uh, 15 more minutes to go. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, I just want to give one comment and one question. Uh, the comment is we had an experience here in the Kingdom of Morocco concerning we are helping farmers to switch from diesel pump to solar pumps. Mm -hmm. And for that, we needed to have, of course, to sensitize the farmers because they're going to, uh, to buy the, bump, the solar pumps. We need, to have, we need to have financing, green financing for those pumps, and we need to have capacity building. And for that, when we are discussing with farmers, they said we need actors in their region mm -hmm. who can size, install, and maintain the solar pumps. Then they have confidence in that new technology. Mm -hmm. We are reaching 60,000 farmers today using solar pumps in the kingdom. Yeah. It's something that is done because of having sensibilization, having financing, and having the capacity building. You need to do all of them in the same time. And capacity building is a key because we had the training center here in Marrakech. Uh, it's a UNESCO center for s solar in Africa. And we were discussing with the private sector what kind of training we should have. Mm -hmm. And to do the right training for those actors was the key also for the project. So that's how we managed today to have almost 600 megawatt of solar pumping in the kingdom. So my question is for the MORSEF, EBRD and BMC mm -hmm. had support. Mm -hmm. for, those for those farmers, we got- I congratulate you for doing without grants <laughs> what you could do with grants. The economy is here, but uh, you, you know, need because have to uh, but it has to be sustainable. And I actually <laughs> hope that with the current rise in price of energy, we see more uh, such initiatives because the economic sense will be there without the need for grants. Mm -hmm. But then the second thing I'd like to say is, uh, uh, that's what you said, you know, I go to the bush and I talk to the chief. Well, we're not in the bush, but I talk <laughs> to my client. And, you know, you're bringing me a problem. Now we're going to bring it back. There's been a drawing of this session. I'm going to bring this back to the drawing board with the team, and we're going to come up with a solution for you. Thank you. Uh, if I, if to I you may. And, and um, I'm sorry, if yeah, I may. Yeah, just one, uh, yes, and congratulations. Just to reinforce one point. You mentioned uh, the right capacity building. Of course, there's not any capacity building. I mean, sometimes, you know, people are trained just for the sake of training on so many things. Um, <laughs> but it has to be linked to opportunities. And, and, uh, and that's what, one of the things that we proud ourselves we do. We speak, always speak with the private sector. Now, how many jobs do you have? Why are you not filling these jobs? I have X amount of jobs. 30% I can't fill because you need to have uh, X, Y, and Z competencies. And then we go and we train those youth according to those competencies to be able to give those companies that need talent the exact talent that they need so that they can grow and they, they can continue creating jobs. Thank you. Uh, we have uh, some questions on, uh, I'm trying to read them. How do we reduce the risk for international banks to invest 
in Africa. How do we reduce the risk for international banks to invest in Africa? And I would like to add a question that I'm teasing. To what extent this continent need an African rating agency for that in order to accompany and to take into account the, sometimes the very specific uh, features of the African economies? And we have also another question, how motivated are European banks to invest in infrastructure projects across Africa? We see a lot of funds already in Africa, but from Chinese banks. Very interesting questions. If any of our panelists would like to answer to these questions. I'll, I'll take the first one. The first one. How do we reduce the risk for I'll international banks to invest indeed, in Africa? Because actually I was asked this uh, on my way here by someone I met. And, but for me, it's actually interesting when people... The, how do we reduce the risk for, for international banks? It's very easy. I'm doing a project right now in uh, Liberia. It's with the IFC. IFC is funding 75% of it, and we're going to fund 25% uh, of it. What, does that, what has that shown to my credit committee? It tells them that, well, if IFC and its DFIs are coming in, it means this is a good project. We're happy to look at it. That's on one side. That's on the reputational side. But on the, on the technical side itself, it's... The, what I look at is, as I said before, when I say I go to the bush, I go to the bush not because I'm happy to live with mosquitoes, but actually because it's when I go to the bush, I know that the project that I'm funding is via the people, is for the people and by the people, and they're the ones that are going to manage it. Therefore, there will never be an issue like you're going to see someone try to destroy, the, destroy it. It's not going to happen. I can give you an example. If you go to a place such as Nigeria or Cameroon, you go to the president and you get a contract and then you go to the and when you go to the president and you come to the to do the due diligence you come in a car guarded and security all over you and the villagers are looking at you the nigerians or the or the village the villagers the indigents are already thinking my government is corrupt these guys are part of them they're corrupt they don't see you they don't see you as part of them they think you're bringing in uh, something from the top, but if you actually involve them from day one as part of it, there's no reason for me to burn my own house down. I'll never do that. It's the, it's the mentality that the locals take, the indigenous take. That's why we try to do it from the root of yeah. this. That's why I'm saying that's how you can reduce the, the risk, by involving the community and also by involving the DFIs. It makes a lot of difference in, in the perception there. Thank you very much, Punmi. Is Valérie or, or uh, any, uh, maybe, uh, Omatoyo? I'm, I'm sorry, Omatoyo. Yes. Omatayo. If any one of you would like to take the floor, you're not with us, but if you can. <laughs> no worries. Um, yes, uh, additionally, we, we need more organizations that could um, offer guarantees and insurances for projects. We need that. We, I know MIGA is doing something, but we need more of that. And so another area that we can use to de-risk uh, uh, projects in Africa is that, yes, what Bumi said is quite good. When DFI is in the project, it gives a peace of mind to other lenders. But we do know that Africa, uh, there are some projects in Africa which um, the DFIs are not funding right now, which are key to Africa development. So we're talking, yes, the DFIs, we're looking at the E movement, but there are some um, mining, that we are not doing mining right now, but there are some mining projects which DFIs are not doing and which, would, which are critical to Africa development. We have a project in Guinea right now. It's for graphite. Graphite is a pro is 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 a key uh, component that is used in lithium battery batteries, and the prices is skyrocketing because we are not having funding for it. There is a black ban ban on mining, and that is affecting that. The prices is going to the roof every day. In fact, we have six off-takers for that project right now. And um, there are still lots of off-takers on the queue, but we need funding. 
So even so, in as much as yes, um, you want to have a GFI, we still need uh, and GFI are doing there some um, policies which I believe they might need to fine tune. We shouldn't have a blanket ban. Yes, I know there are concerns for um, for the environment. Yes, what we need is to have a framework, a policy framework that says, for us to do this, we must meet this criteria. But having a blanket ban on some sectors might be a bit detrimental to the development of Africa and even for some key resource that the world needs. We can't do uh, solar, we can't do e-movement, we can't do this without the battery powering that. So that is... Uh, a key point I want us to look into and probably one of the takeaways out of this that we need to look into that area. So apart from that, we need uh, guarantees, we need insurances, we need um, um, uh, the knowledge and funding that could assist in the risking projects. That is key. Thank, Thank you, you very so much. much. Anyone would like to, uh, to add, uh, Valérie Joël, please? Yes, yes, thank you very much. Um, there's something, you know, that, you know, which is a powerful tool, you know, for the UAD. Uh, as you know, we are accredited, you know, I mean, to different funds. And, uh, and the mechanism, you know, is interesting, you know, because uh, they come, you know, uh, as a co-financing, you know, with the UAD. So we put our balance sheet and they, they provide additionality uh, in order, you know, when a, sub when a project is not uh, bankable, you know, from a commercial point of view, had you know additionality in order to make it uh, you know happen, and and there's some preconditions. You know, the project have to be green. Uh, there's certain diligence and disclosure that we have to do, but uh, it helps. You know, I mean, the, you know, I mean, to provide you know additionality. You know, uh, through you know these uh, fund mechanisms. So I just want to have that as well. Thank you, Valérie Joël. We have five more minutes to go, and even four more minutes. I want to be the timekeeper. Francis, there was please. a question on, on, on funds. Yes. Um, and, uh, um, you know, obviously it's project by project, you yeah. know. But uh, one thing I, I can say to this is not because someone proposes to fund it that makes it a good project. Sometimes there's political reasons to fund projects. Mm -hmm. And uh, often I, I see people say, oh, there's almost free funding coming for this project. Yeah. And I often ask, how free do you really think it is? <laughs> do you think it comes without strings attached when it's free? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I'm leaving it to that question. Yeah. Uh, but certainly I'm happy that, you know, IFIs provide the peace of mind. Mm -hmm. I'd like to say the one thing, uh, and if you uh, forgive me for putting you on the spot, but we do nothing without our clients. And uh, BMC in Morocco has been a pioneering client. We did our first transaction together almost 10 years ago, the first More euro Seth bond, and euro the bond. first euro bond of a, of a corporate yes. in, uh, in Morocco. Yeah. We also did, uh, you were a pioneer in the Morsef. You were the first bank in the whole world to sign on yes. to the COVID uh, resilience, resilience package yeah. of EBRD, the fastest of all of the 300 <laughs> banks and all of the clients of EBRD. So we thought it was very fitting in this, and sorry for being the host now as the EBRD person, to give you a little bit uh, a, a present and a, a memo to these achievements together as a symbol that without our clients, we are nothing. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm really touched. Thank you. Thank you very much. I will. Thank you. I will share it. Merci beaucoup. Merci. I think we always came to the end. Uh, if there is no other questions, yeah, there is a last one. We have two more minutes, two, three more minutes. As bankers, on n'aime pas les dépassements. Hello. Hello. Please. Well, th thank you for the presentation, and maybe I missed something. Um, I came a little bit late, but can you please elaborate on the role that local capital markets and stock exchange can help to refinance the banks and fuel this uh, uh, massive funds that can be raised through capital markets to the capital uh, to the private sector, please? Yeah, the the reforms of uh, capital markets, and essentially, I think, I, I guess. Uh, the insurance, the life insurance, and all these are, uh, are absolutely uh, 
critical in order to have long-term resources to be dedicated to this long-term, and Bunmi was talking about the long tenure that we have in order to have more uh, our commercial bankers involved. For our part, we try, thanks to DF, EBRD and other DFIs, to uh, invest more and more in, in this, uh, what we consider as the mainstream finance. That means sustainable finance is in French, pleonasme. I think that's mainstream. I'm very happy, and thanks again. Uh, uh, I would like to thank you very much, dear panelists, for your participation and also the audience. And uh, thank you again for this, uh, for this trophy. Thank, thank you very you. much. It's for you too. Merci. Merci beaucoup. Merci. Thanks to you.